in a previous lecture we have looked at the design of sanitary sewerage systems in this lecture we will discuss the design of storm water sewerage systems what is storm water the storm water is the surface runoff from the rain and a storm sewer is a sewer which carries the storm water in the earlier days people used to design a combined sewerage systems or a combined sewer is a sewer which carries storm water as well as sanitary waste water the problems with the design of combined sewerage systems we will discuss later first we will concentrate on the design of storm water sewerage systems in this figure we will see the layout of a, uh, a storm water sewerage system which can also be used for combined sewerage system here this is a lateral and then all the laterals join to form a sub main sewer and the sub main sewers join to form main or trunk sewer the excess rain water from the drainage area which i am showing here gets collected into the laterals first similarly the excess rain water from this drainage area gets collected into this lateral first and all the laterals join to make a sub main sewer and sub main sewers join to make the main trunk or sewer system so in the design of a storm sewerage system like this the first step is to estimate the amount of storm water quantity what are the steps involved in the estimation of storm water quantity there are several methods which are available first is rational method which is the simplest to use and it is the most popular method many designs even now in our country are being done by this rational method other methods are also available like scs technique scs or soil conservation society of united states department of agriculture has come up with a method called curve number method for estimating the storm water quantity there are also commercial software which are available which estimate this quantity in a more refined manner for example storm water management model or swmm is one such software us corps of engineers also has developed one software for this purpose this is called the storm in this lecture we will concentrate only on the estimation of storm water quantity using rational method for example see this particular figure here i have a storm sewer and this is the inlet for the storm sewer and this water is getting carried in this direction all this area which is marked by this dashed line is called the drainage area the rain falling in this particular area the excess of this rain travels in this direction and enters the storm sewer at this point at the inlet point we are interested in knowing how much of the discharge that is going to come into the storm sewer or for what discharge this storm sewer should be designed that discharge is given as q which is runoff in meter cube per hour that runoff is equal to 10 multiplied by c multiplied by i multiplied by a c is what we call coefficient of runoff i is intensity of rainfall in mm per hour and a is the area of drainage in hectares this is the drainage area that is contributing the flow to the storm sewer so this area we should know and that is what we call the area of drainage and i is the intensity of rainfall that we can get from the rainfall measurements in that particular area c is the coefficient of runoff not all the rain that falls in this particular area will contribute to the flow in to the sewer because some of the rain would have been stored in the depression storage in the drainage area or a lot of rain water would have percolated into the ground so not all the rain that is falling here will contribute to the flow in this particular storm sewer we look at how to estimate this coefficient of runoff and the intensity of rainfall in more detailed manner in the next few uh, minutes the design peak flow we need to know what is the data required first of all consider a storm sewerage system like this i have a lateral here 
I have another lateral here, I have another lateral here and this is the drainage area for the lateral, this is the inlet. Similarly, this is the drainage area for the lateral and this is the inlet, this is the drainage area for this lateral and this is the inlet. This lateral and this lateral are forming to this particular sewer. So, the amount of discharge that is coming here is combined discharge from these two laterals. Not only that, there will be a time lag effect. The peak flow that is occurring here will occur at a, a little time earlier compared to the peak flow in this. So, that time lag one has to consider while estimating the design peak flow for this, uh, this uh, sewer here. Similarly, the time lag that occurs for the peak flow to occur from this point to this point here has to be considered while designing the storm sewer in this uh, region. The design peak flow, the data required are the rainfall depth duration frequency curves. This one can get by collecting the rainfall information and conducting the hydrological analysis. Then we need to know about the probable future conditions of drainage area. For example, this is the drainage area currently which is grassland. Maybe in future there is urbanization that is taking place and all this area gets paved. Once the area gets paved, then the amount of rainfall that is coming here and what is the amount of percolation that is going to be affected certainly depends upon what kind of pavement I have. So, if it is completely concreted, then one can say that almost 100 percent of the rain will appear in the in the storm sewer here. So, we have to see what is the future scenario regarding the development of the drainage area and that we have to factor it into our design. So, the probable future conditions of drainage area is an important information. This is very difficult to quantify, but one has to think about it while doing the design. Then the runoff coefficient for different land use patterns. Again, if the land use pattern if you have parks, then the amount of rain that comes into the storm sewer is going to be different compared to if that area is full of houses and apartments and so on and so forth. So, depending upon what is the land use in the drainage area, we have the, uh, the runoff coefficient gets affected. We will see this in more uh, detail. The other important information that is required for estimating the design peak flow is the inlet time. Inlet time is the time taken by water to move from the farthest point on the drainage area to the first point in the of the inlet sewer. So, if I have the rain falling in this particular drainage area, I see what is the time taken for the water particle to travel from this point to this point that is what we call the inlet time. Then area tributary to the sewer is another information that is required for estimating the design discharge that I have already talked about what is the area tributary to the sewer. This is, this is the area tributary to this particular sewer here, this is the area tributary to the sewer here, this is the area tributary to the sewer here. So, the area, the what is the area of this the drainage uh, uh, basin uh, contributing to the flow here should be known. Time of concentration is another important parameter to be considered in the design. The time of concentration is defined as inlet time plus travel time. For example, consider the network here. For the water particle to move from here to here, it takes some time and that time is what we call the inlet time. Then the water particle has to start from this point and then move all the way down the sewerage system. If I am considering this part of the sewerage system, I am interested in the design for this particular sewer, then I have to see what is the total time that is taken for the water particle to come from the farthest point in the drainage area that is inlet time plus this is the farthest lateral corresponding to this particular sewer here. So, what is the time taken for the water particle to travel in the sewerage system itself should be added to the inlet time. That is the travel time plus the inlet time is what we call the time of concentration. 
the time of concentration here truly indicates the picture when the entire drainage area when the rain is falling on the entire drainage area and, and all that rain is contributing to the flow here that is what the meaning of concentration uh, time of concentration and that is an important parameter in the design of sewerage system. The other uh, again inlet time if you look at the inlet time is a function of surface roughness, depression storage, steepness of slope, size of the block and spacing of streets. For example, if the surface is very rough then the velocity will be small or velocity will be or the water will be moving slower and your inlet time will be higher. Similarly, if you have depression storage in the initial stages of the rain most of the rain water will get stored in those depressions. So, it will take time for the rain water from the farthest end to go and then reach the inlet point of the sewer. So, the depression storage is another important factor which affects the inlet time. Similarly, the steepness of slope if the slope is very steep then the velocities for the flow over the surface the overland flow velocity will be faster and then inlet time will be shorter. Similarly, the size of the block if the farthest point is very very far away from the inlet point of the sewer then obviously, the inlet time will be longer I mean we have longer in the larger inlet times. Similarly, spacing of streets the spacing of streets is affecting your inlet time is because your sewers are normally placed below the streets. So, if you have more number of streets then you have going to have more number of laterals that means the farthest point from the drainage basin to the inlet point will be very uh, will not be as much long as if the laterals are not many. So, here inlet time will be short if the spacing of streets is more dense. Typically inlet time can be estimated using certain guidelines which are given here 5 to 10 minutes is the inlet time for high density areas with closely spaced streets. 10 to 20 minutes is for well developed areas with relatively flat slopes as you can see when you have flat slopes then inlet time increases because for the flat slopes the velocities will be slower. Similarly, 20 to 30 minutes is for residential areas with widely spaced street inlets. So, the inlet time will be more because the number of street inlets is less. So, they are widely spaced the runoff coefficient is basically equal to the amount of rain I mean the percentage of rainfall that is going to come into the sewer. The runoff coefficient is reduced by the evaporation loss, the depression storage, surface wetting and percolation. Evaporation imagine the rain falling in the month of June just after a uh, just after the summer season. Now, the temperatures are going to be high. So, as the rain is falling much of this rain or a part of this rain itself is going to get evaporated or it falls on very hot surfaces and it gets evaporated. So, evaporation as the rain is falling is an important factor in the decision for the runoff coefficient. Similarly, if the ground is uneven the lot of potholes are there lot of depressions are there in the surface then the initial part of the rain is going to get stored in these depressions. So, that way the depression storage is also an important factor in the terms of how much of rain will come into the storm sewer. The surface wetting if a rain has already occurred sometime before and the ground is completely wet if this is followed by a subsequent rain then because the ground is already wet the amount of percolation that takes place into the ground gets reduced because the ground is already saturated. Naturally, the amount of overland flow that is occurring will be higher. So, more amount of water will come into the storm sewer. So, your runoff coefficient in such a case will be higher. This percolation and surface wetting are kind of interrelated to each other. Now, runoff coefficient depends upon 
imperviousness, duration of rainfall and shape of drainage area. For example, if the surface is highly impervious then the runoff coefficient will be very high. If the duration of rainfall is very long then again the runoff coefficient will be higher because in the initial stages of rain more of the rainfall gets percolated into the ground and as the ground is getting saturated and if the rainfall is still occurring naturally the amount of rainfall that appears as overland flow will be more. So, duration of rainfall has an effect on the runoff coefficient this we will see in the next few minutes. First of all for estimating the runoff coefficient we need to determine the average degree of impervious, imperviousness of the drainage area. The whole drainage area can be divided into several regions of homogeneity or the local homogeneity and a runoff uh, and a imperviousness uh, factor is assigned to each of these areas. For example, if we have commercial areas then the imperviousness factor is 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. For residential areas where we have high density population then the imper, uh, imperviousness factor or co, uh, factor is 0 0.6 to 0 0.75. For low density residential areas it is 0 0.35 to 0 0.60. Now parks and undeveloped areas, parks and undeveloped areas the concrete pavement is not going to be there, it is mostly grassland. So, the percolation will be very high or the infiltration will be very high. In such cases, the amount of overland flow will be low that is why we have imperviousness factor here as 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. The average imperviousness factor for the whole area is made up as a weight uh, as sigma ai i i divided by sigma ai where i is a part of the drainage area, a sub part of the drainage area I which has an imperviousness factor of capital I I and the area of that sub part is A I. So, we basically multiply A I with uh, I I and then take the summation divided by the total drainage area will give us a, an average imperviousness factor. Then next we need to determine the duration of the design storm. Typically what we do for the design is the duration of the storm is taken as more than or equal to time of concentration Tc. This we discussed earlier how to estimate the time of concentration. The time of concentration is inlet time plus travel time. Now the this C that is your runoff coefficient is a function of duration of design storm. This we already have which we have taken as more than or equal to the time of concentration and average degree of imperviousness and it also depends upon the shape of drainage area a fan shaped, rectangular shaped or circular shaped. The standard tables are available for picking up the value of C based on these three factors. We can also pick the value of runoff coefficient from tables which are directly instead of uh, worrying about what is the imperviousness factor, what is the uh, duration of the storm etcetera. This also is many times done if we want to make quick calculations or if we do not have much information available to us. For example, residential areas where the single family units are there the runoff coefficient is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. If we have in residential areas multi units with attached then 0 0.6 to 0 0.75. Parts and symmetries the runoff coefficient is 0 0.1 to 0 0.25. Pavements which are made of brick then 0 0.7 to 0 0.85. In that manner like lawns and sandy soils the percolation or the infiltration loss will be lot more. So, the runoff coefficient will be very low 0.05 to 0.2. The next important step in the estimation of design uh, the design storm uh, design uh, Q is 
the estimation of design storm frequency. Typically, the storm sewers are not designed for the peak flow rate occurrence such as once in 10 years or more. Such a design would uh, result in uh, over design because the storms are occurring only once in 10 years. Not only that, it will result in the uh, adoption, I mean if we want to treat this water or if we want to pump this water, then those pumping stations and treatment stations, they will be designed for very high value of Q and that will result in high uh, um, uh, cost. So, we do not design the storm sewer systems for uh, peak flow rates of occurrence such as once in 10 years or more. But at the same time, we have to provide sufficient capacity to avoid too frequent flooding. If our system is not designed adequately to carry the water that is coming from more frequently occurring storms and the pipe, the sizes of the storm sewers are chosen very small, then the frequency of flooding will increase. So, the design of these storm sewerage systems should typically depend upon what kind of the storm frequency we take for the design. Now, the frequency of permissible flooding varies from place to place depending upon the importance of the activity in that area. Typically, the suggested values for frequency of flooding in residential areas are peripheral areas twice a year. That means, in the residential areas which are kind of suburbs, we would allow flooding twice a year. We would design our storm severage system in such a way that we would not say that it has failed if the flooding is only twice a year. Whereas, in high priced areas, our storm severage system should be designed in such a manner that the flooding should not be more than once a year. Whereas, in commercial areas where the flooding can affect the, the activity or will result in loss of the uh, income, we would not allow flooding more than once in two years. Instead of going for frequency of flooding as a parameter in the design, we can also go for frequency of storm events as a parameter in the design. In fact, this is more easier manner in which we can do the design. So, there are guidelines available for storm a frequency of storm events or the design storm which should be considered in the design of storm sewerage system. For residential areas, we consider the rainfall, the design rainfall is such that it the probability of occurrence of this design rainfall is once in 2 to 10 years. So, we, we can choose anywhere between 2 to 10 years as a recurrence interval for our, for our design storm. Whereas, in commercial areas, we take the design storm recurrence interval as once in every 10 to 30 years. That means, the probability of occurrence of the rainfall is once in 10 to 30 years. That kind of a storm will have very high magnitude, very high rainfall depth or rainfall intensity. So, if we design for that storm which is going to occur once in 10 to 30 years, then our we will have adequate capacity in the storm sewerage system. So, the design rainfall intensity, how do we estimate the design rainfall intensity? First, we have to collect rainfall data for the area for as many years as possible. Particularly for urban areas, this rainfall data is typically available for the previous 30 to 50 years. You co we construct rainfall data for that area. Then we use hydrologic analysis principles. This I will not go in detail in this particular lecture, but you must have learned in some other course. Use hydrologic analysis principles to prepare precipitation duration frequency curves. What are these precipitation duration frequency curves and how do they look? Here I give a typical precipitation duration frequency curve. Here the on the x axis you have recurrence interval. The recurrence interval is the inverse of the frequency or when we say the storm probability is once in 10 to 10 years. That means, the recurrence interval is 10 years. 
or if the storm is occurring once in 30 years that means the recurrence interval is 30 years. On the y axis you have the precipitation here this particular figure the units are used as inches but in India we use the units in mm. So, we have the precipitation depth on the y axis and these curves are the precipitation duration frequency curve. The 5 minutes that is shown on this curve indicates that the probability of occurrence let us say I take this point here which says that the probability of occurrence of this storm is once a year and the storm duration is 5 minutes and corresponding to that we get a precipitation in inches about 0 0.2225. Okay. So, this figure can be used to estimate the intensity of the storm. How do we do that? We first select the frequency or the recurrence interval for design storm. As I mentioned, we can take this recurrence interval as anywhere between 2 to 10 years for residential areas or 10 to 30 years for commercial areas. So, you choose the frequency or the recurrence interval first. Next, we estimate the duration of rainfall. The duration of rainfall we take in our design calculations is same as time of concentration. We have seen how to estimate the time of concentration which is equal to the inlet time plus the travel time in the system. Then we go to this figure, we know the recurrence interval let us say 2 years and let us say our time of concentration is 1 hour, then the duration of the rainfall is taken as 1 hour. So, 2 and I go here to 1 hour and then from that I read off the value for the precipitation depth or the precipitation which is almost equal to 1.4 inches. Once I have the precipitation, I also know what is my duration of the storm which is 1 hour. So, the intensity would come out to be 1.5 inches per hour. This is the I value I would use in my rational method. As I mentioned, intensity is equal to depth that I read from the figure divided by the duration. Next, we see what are the what goes into the design of storm sewers? What is the underlying concept for the design of storm sewers? In the past, sewers are designed to drain local areas rapidly. Now, that kind of a concept is not used in the design these days. Currently, it is important in our design to consider how the peak flows can be reduced to mitigate flooding problems. So, an overall picture has to be taken into consideration. That means, we need to design our system in such a way that the peak flow rate is somehow reduced, so that there is not much of stress on the receiving water bodies or the downstream flooding is reduced. If the, the amount of the peak flow discharge is reduced through our design, then the downstream areas will not get flooded more frequently as well as my receiving water body will be able to carry this amount of water without any flooding. The techniques for reducing storm flows, what are the different techniques for reducing the storm flows? First we consider the roof drains. The water from the roof drains do not take it and then leave it on the paved surfaces because if you leave it on the paved surfaces then it will go into the storm sewerage system very quickly and the time of concentration will be very low or the all the areas will be contributing simultaneously to the flow in the storm sewers and the peak flow will be very high. So, we want to slow it down. How do we do that? We take the rain water from the roof drains and first discharge it to the grass areas. So, it will flow over the grass areas before it goes into the storm sewers. The surface grading, we use contour grading so that the slope is not very high and the water finds its way to the storm sewers in a more natural manner. We can also slow down the slow down the uh, movement of water to the storm sewerage system 
from the adjoining areas by having detention ponds. Each detention pond is like a mini flood control reservoir. Water will first come into the detention pond, it gets detained there, it sits there for some time before it goes into the storm sewerage system. So, this also is used for reducing storm flows. The paving, the choosing of the paving material is very important in reducing the storm flows. So, when we are allowing the development to take place, we make sure that pavements are made out of porous materials like asphalt or interlocking blocks or gravel. If you have let us say a porous material like gravel, when the rain falls on that and as it flows, there is lot of infiltration that is going to take place and the amount of water that gets into the storm sewers is going to be less, because more of water would have gone into the ground to uh, reach the ground water table. Other important consideration is in the design of ditches. If, it, if the ditches are, are made of, I mean if you use grass ditches as compared to the concrete ditches or other paved ditches, then certainly the roughness will be very high for the grass ditches and that is going to slow down the movement of water. Similarly, through the grass ditches there will be more percolation that also will reduce the amount of storm flow. So, we need to if we follow these, uh, these guidelines and then do the development of that area, then the capacity for which the storm sewerage system should be designed will be low. That means, the value of Q will be low and the storm sewerage system can uh, adequately drain off the area in a proper manner. The storm drainage system is made up of two components. In fact, there is a minor system and there is a major system. What is a minor system? Sewers designed to accommodate storms of short recurrence interval, 2 to 5 years, it is called a minor system. The purpose of the minor system is to prevent flooding of roadways and adjoining areas by moderate storms. That is once in two, 2 years or once in 3 years kind of a storm is occurring in that area and the minor system should be designed in such a way that for that kind of a storm, it should prevent flooding of roadways and adjoining areas. The major system is defined as the path followed by flow during major storms. Here, the major storms are the storms which are not considered in the design of minor system. Let us say, I have considered 3 years as the recurrence interval for the design storm in the design of minor system. So, any storm which has a recurrence interval more than 3 years or any storm which has a probability of occurrence of once in 10 years is called a major storm. So, the Certainly, the minor system will not be able to carry all the storm water that is coming when a major storm occurs. So, the water is going to flood the adjoining areas and water is going to flow in the streets and adjoining lands. So, the major system includes the streets, adjoining lands and natural drainage channels. When we are doing the development, we may not go and then uh, the spoil the natural drainage system, we may uh, leave it there in its place. So, in such cases, these natural drainage channels also can be used for draining of the areas when a major storm occurs. Similarly, when a major storm occurs to reduce the peak flow, we can use the detention ponds. That way, the major system includes the proper design of streets for the drainage, the adjoining land, the landscaping of the adjoining land how we retain the natural drainage channels and how, how many detention ponds and what is the size of the ponds we are going to put. All these things in an integrated manner should be considered in the design of a major system. I want to mention one thing here. For the design of major system, the estimation of the peak flow rates, we should not consider or we should not use the rational method. The rational method is based on the concept of steady uniform flow. But in actuality, the flow in a sewerage system or the storm sewerage system is always an unsteady non-uniform flow. Although we are making this assumption, the errors introduced 
as far as the design is concerned is not very much when we are we are think we are designing a minor system but the errors introduced if we use a rational method for uh, estimating peak flows for the design of a major system will be very very high so the major systems have to be designed using what we call model based techniques the model based techniques for the design of major systems consider the complete unsteady non uniform flow situation that is beyond the scope of this lecture what is the design criteria when we are designing a storm sewerage system here i have given parameters and correspondingly the criteria the minimum velocity in a storm sewerage system should be 1 meter per second this is to ensure self cleansing then depth below grade as opposed to or as compared to sanitary sewerage system the depth below the grade for a storm sewerage system should be just sufficient to receive water from street inlets we have street inlets from which water gets carried to the storm sewerage system so the storm sewerage should be just below the ground such that it receives water from the street inlets without any problem if we have any more depth than this then the construction cost or the laying cost will be very high whereas in sanitary sewerage systems the depth below the grade is much larger the sanitary sewers are buried much more deeper into the ground so that they can get water even from the basements of the buildings then the depth of flow here in a storm sewerage system we allow full depth of flow and in fact sometimes we design such that a slight surcharging slight surcharging means the water the storm sewer will be completely full of water and it will be flowing under pressure so slight surcharging is also allowed many times in the design of storm sewerage system so that the size of the sewer can be smaller and then we get a uh, better economy this is not done in a sanitary uh, while designing a sanitary sewer while designing a sanitary sewer we have to design in such a way that there is some amount of space between the water surface and the top of the sewer this is to accommodate the gases that are being released from a sanitary sewer that kind of a problem doesn't arise in the design of storm sewers so we allow full depths to occur and sometimes even the slightly surcharged conditions other important criteria for the design is the manhole spacing here it is given as 90 to 120 meters if we have mechanized cleaning of the man uh, the storm sewers or if the better uh, maintenance facilities are available for the manholes then we can go for 90 to 120 meters spacing of the manholes otherwise the manhole spacing should be much uh, shorter than this probably we go for about 30 meters for the manhole spacing if the sewers are clean manually what are the design steps the design steps include the determ uh, determination of sewer location sewers are typically located underneath the streets or underneath the pavements and they follow the natural slopes so if we have map like this then from the local map the road map following the streets we can come up with a layout for the sewers this is the first step next we compute the peak rate of flow q using rational method this we have uh, discussed in detail earlier after computing the q for each uh, uh, location in the storm sewerage system we have to determine the preliminary slope of the sewer typically the slope of the sewer is taken as the ground slope to start with to start the design calculations then we select an initial pipe size earlier experience in the design will help in the selection of the initial pipe size after selecting the size we know the diameter of the sewer the storm sewer we know the slope we know the discharge what we do is from the slope 
and the size of the sewer and we know we assume that this sewer is going to flow full, but under free surface conditions we use Manning's equation to determine what is the capacity of sewer. We have looked at the Manning's equation in the previous lecture on design of sanitary sewerage systems. So, using the Manning's equation we estimate the capacity of sewer and we also get the velocity and this capacity of the sewer should be greater than whatever is the design peak rate of flow. For the actual rate of flow, we can also estimate what is the velocity that is going to come in. After this step, we establish invert elevations of the sewer because we know what is the slope of the sewer and we have the guidelines on what should be the depth of burial. We can get the invert elevations for each of the sewers. After this, we repeat steps 8 to 11 if necessary. That means, if the capacity of the sewer is less than what is the design peak rate of flow or if the velocity in the sewer is less than what is the minimum velocity that is required or if the slope that is provided is excessive or very flat, then we repeat the steps 8 to 11 so that our design comes out properly and economically. Now, we talk about collection of combined sewage. The storm waters in a combined sewerage system, the storm waters often exceed sanitary sewage by 50 to 100 times. This is an important consideration in the design of a combined sewerage system. Not only that, it is obvious that surface runoff rate cannot be estimated very accurately, whether for storm sewerage system or combined sewerage system as compared to the estimation of sanitary sewage for the design of a sanitary sewerage system. That is more, that can be done more precisely as compared to the estimation of surface runoff rate. We also have to design the combined sewers for I mean we design combined sewers as storm drains, because the combined sewers have to carry the storm water as well as sanitary sewage. And as I mentioned the sanitary sewage uh, the storm waters is many times 50 to 100 times the sanitary sewage. So, we design the combined sewers as storm drains. However, because they are also carrying the sanitary sewage, they should be able to collect this sanitary sewage from the buildings. So, they should be buried much more deeper compared to the storm drains. So, they are placed as deep as sanitary sewers, that is an important point. Thus, in a storm sewer or a storm drain, we allow surcharge and overflow that will not give rise to any safety problems. Whereas, in a combined sewerage system, because they are carrying even the sanitary sewage, the surcharge is not allowed. Also, the overflow is objectionable. A storm sewer, which is designed for let us say a, a um, return period or a storm of 1 in 10 years. But a storm of 1 in 20 years occurs. So, we will be allowing some amount of overflow. However, when we design a combined sewerage system, we cannot go with that kind of a philosophy, because under no circumstance the overflow is allowed if it is carrying a sanitary sewage, because that is going to give rise to the health problems or the health risk will be very high. Also, the velocities up to 1.55 meters per second should be allowed in these combined sewers, so that they are kept clean. Other most crucial point in the design of combined sewers is the wide range of flow. During the rainy season, the flow that needs to be carried by the drains will be much, much higher compared to the non-rainy season. This has to be 
kept in mind. Because of this point, because of the wide variation in the range of flow and we need to have self cleansing velocities even when the flow is not very high, that is even when the storm is not occurring and only sanitary sewage is being carried, we need to have a minimum velocity or minimum self cleansing velocity. Because of this requirement, the cross sectional shape that we choose is going to be very important. The choice of cross sectional shape depends upon hydraulic parameters, the structural strength that the particular shape can, uh, can have and economic considerations. For example, we take this shape, this egg shaped or the oval shape, it is made of two circles here like a large circle here and a smaller circle here. This is meant for carrying the flows when there is no rain. So, it is meant for carrying sanitary sewage, whereas the flow would be occurring in this portion when it is carrying both sanitary sewage and the storm sewage. So, storm sewage is the quantity of the storm sewage is normally very high. So, we need to have higher capacity that is why we have chosen a shape like this. For when it is carrying only the sanitary sewage, then the width is less here and the velocity will be very high. In fact, this particular shape, if you look at the hydraulic radius for the shape is more or less equal whatever be the depth of flow. If the hydraulic radius is same and the same slope is there for whatever be the depth, the velocities will be more or less same. So, whatever be the depth of the flow, the velocities, the self cleansing velocities are maintained in the shape, but the problem with the shape is the structural strength. It is, it is not very good as far as the load carrying capacity is concerned. This is a semicircular section with a Q net. This is what we call a Q net. It is obvious that when only sanitary sewage is being carried, then the depths of flow will be very less and the width here is less. So, naturally the velocities will be very high and we will be able to maintain the self cleansing velocity even when only sanitary sewage is being carried. Whereas, when the combined sewage is being carried, we need to have more capacity and we have a larger width here or, or a semicircular shape here. A rectangular section is sometimes adopted, this is because for economic reasons, the trenching cost will be much less here in a rectangular section. And not only that, the headroom that I need to provide when I am carrying the combined sewage above the water surface level and the crown of this thing, that headroom that needs to be provided will not be very high because I have enough width here. Of course, as I said, the main consideration in choosing a rectangular section is the economy. Many times horseshoe sections are adopted for designing storm sewerage systems. A horseshoe section has very good structural strength. Of course, because the width is very high even when the depth of the flow is small, this may not be as good for carrying a combined sewage. Next important aspect in the design of a storm sewerage system is the storm water inlets. The storm water inlets are the devices meant to admit surface runoff to the sewers. We have to give careful consideration to their design, to the placement of this storm water inlets. However good our design of storm drains is, if the inlets are not designed, because these inlets are the entry points for the storm water into the drainage system. If they are not designed properly, then the flooding is going to occur. So, it is a careful consideration should be given to their location and design. There are different types of these storm water inlets. For example, curb inlets, gutter inlets and combination inlets and all three of them can be either depressed or flush. Now, depending upon their elevation with respect to or with reference to the pavement surface. The materials for inlets should brick should be used as 
for the construction of these inlets. Sometime we also use cast iron gratings conforming to IS 5961 for the construction of inlets or fabricated steel gratings may also be used if there is low vehicular traffic. In the gratings the clear opening space should be more than 25 mm and the connecting pipe from the street inlet to main street sewer should not be less than 200 mm diameter and it should have enough slope. If it is less than this then it will be getting choked more frequently. The maximum spacing of inlets is a function of the road surface, the size of the inlet, the type of the inlet and the rainfall. If the rainfall is the rainfall magnitude is very high then certainly we have to place these inlets at more frequent intervals and but of course if the size of the inlet is very large then we may not have to place them at closer intervals. So all these are interrelated factors based on which the spacing of inlets is chosen. Typically maximum spacing is 30 meters. Now the straight inlets are so placed and designed such that they can remove the flow in gutters with a minimum cost with minimum interference to the traffic, the vehicular traffic as well as pedestrian traffic. They should not come in the way of the movement of people and the vehicles. So the interference to the pedestrian and vehicular traffic is a, an important consideration in the in choosing what type of inlet that we want to have. Certain inlets have better hydraulic capacity but they are costly. Certain other types will enter with traffic and we cannot choose them if the traffic is very high. Curb inlets are vertical openings in the roads through which the storm water flows. These curb inlets are the ones which are preferred if the heavy vehicular traffic is anticipated. Look at this figure, this is the curb inlets. This is my road, between the road and the pavement is what we call the gutter that is a slightly depressed from the road elevation. Then we have this pavement, this is the curb we make an opening in this curb. So the rain water which is getting collected in the gutter will go through this curb into the, the storm water drain which is placed underneath this. This is what we call edge grade curb inlet. We can also have a curb inlet which is not edge grade. Look at this figure. The curb inlet is depressed compared to what is the average elevation of this gutter. So this is called a depressed. This kind of a depression will allow better flow into the curb and the capacity for the curb inlet to take the water, the rate of flow will be higher. So that is where we get the this depressed. But if you have depressions like this, this will may interfere with vehicular traffic. We may also have deflecting uh, structures like this in the curb inlets which will guide the flow into the curbs. So the capacity of the curb inlets gets increased if you have a deflecting type of a curb inlet. A gutter inlet is the one which is placed in the gutter itself. It is flush with the gutter. These are the gratings or the bars and this is the spacing that I was talking earlier and the material that is going for this construction of this, uh, this uh, gutter inlets. This is at grade gutter inlet. This is a depressed gutter inlet, the same gutter inlet but it is where we place this gutter inlet, we, read, we uh, put it slightly lower, uh, slightly below the actual uh, gutter elevation at that location. The gutter inlets consist of horizontal openings in the gutter which is covered by one or more gratings through which the water flows. These are used only where the traffic is forced to move relatively slowly. We may also have combination inlets. This is 
a curb inlet which is being used along with a gutter inlet and it is depressed. We can also use multiple curb and gutter inlets. This is at grade and this is a gutter inlet. This is also a gutter inlet which is placed somewhere downstream of this and this is a curb inlet and this is at grade. Now, gutter capacity can be expressed by Manning formulations. The amount of water that is flowing in the gutter can be estimated using the Manning's equation and the Manning roughness coefficient we normally take is 0 0.015. Now, intake capacity of curb inlets can be increased with increasing, uh, 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 in, sorry, intake capacity of curb inlets increases with decreasing the street grade or increasing the crown slope. Now, curb inlets with deflectors are more efficient as grades become steeper. Gutter inlets are also more efficient than curb inlets, but as it is obvious, these inlets cannot, uh, these inlets get closed much more uh, frequently and that is a problem. Now, combination inlets are better. In combination inlets, we place the gratings downstream from curb inlets. Now, gratings for gutter inlets are efficient when bars are parallel to the curb. But sometimes we may need cross bars for the strength purpose. These cross bars should be placed below these parallel bars. In this lecture, we have seen the design of the storm drains or the design of a storm sewerage system. We have discussed how to estimate the carrying, how to estimate what is the design flow rate. We also looked at what are the different steps we should follow for the design of this storm sewerage systems. We looked at the rational equation for estimation of cube. We also discussed the problems that are faced while designing a combined sewerage system. We looked at the different shapes that can be adopted while designing the storm drains and we looked at what are the different inlets or the different types of inlets we should provide or we can provide while designing this storm sewerage systems. In the next class, we will look at the design of pumping systems. The pumping is to be carried out many times in sanitary sewerage systems as well as storm drainage systems. Thank you.